So this is another good evening that the Lord Almighty has given us. I want to thank you so much, my viewer, and I welcome you on board as we get through, we cruise through this service. It's a midweek service. And like always say, this is the place where we raise <coughs> life to real meaning. Jesus New Life Ministries, Jenalim Church, loves you. We appreciate you. We pray for you <coughs> as you continue commenting and even uh, liking our page. We have you at heart. We'll continue believing God for you to excel <coughs> wherever you are. And like we keep saying, please, when you join, when you are on board, and sure to share this uh, wall with other people. Let's not be mean. We need to give out. You are given freely. Jesus said you should also give uh, freely. Let members of your family get to know that there is a place where we can fellowship, where we can share, and where we can encourage one another. Something else is that Wednesday, we deal with real life empowerment. And uh, I want us to pray, <clears throat> even thanking God for the moment and the opportunity. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you this particular hour of the evening. We give you glory and we give you honor. We thank you because you are so great. You are mighty. Jehovah, we hold on to your to your mercies and to your love. And today we want to ask you that you use me to share your word with everyone. God Almighty, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be at work, helping me to share the word and even to build the hearts of people. This being the place of raising life to real meaning, a place of transformation, help each and every viewer God to get that which you've apportioned them. Thank you so much our God. We are so happy that in our country Kenya we are this week enjoying the small opening that widow opening for our churches to gather. However the number seems to be small to gather but we thank you for the opportunity and I declare that through that opening Jehovah men and women shall find peace shall find grace and hope this is my prayer in Jesus name amen and amen again we gather here to share uh, more about remember we've been dealing with a series concerning uh, the dimensions of the power to create world and today I want to bring on board this topic on financial intelligence financial intelligence many people have been telling me yes we are waiting for that because I promised last Wednesday that today we are coming to tackle this one. We'll be dealing with this. It's very important for us, financial intelligence. And uh, I want to uh, admit to you and to everybody that uh, when you talk of ignorance, ignorance will never be for any excuse. It will not be excused. And that's why we say we need to know. When you talk of intelligence, I know you have talked of uh, uh, what we call IQ in so many things. When you are looking at people, sometimes you want to discover who is genius, who is so bright. And I've also come to realize with money matters, money matters, the information you have, what you know, will determine what you are going to get. Knowledge is so important and I am saying this because we have the word of God with us that is very, very clear. Very, very clear. And uh, when I look at what the Bible says, let me, let me start with uh, Proverbs chapter number 13 and verse 22. There is a verse there <coughs> that's unique for us. 
Proverbs 13 verse 22. So let's look at it. A reading from New King James Version. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is laid up or is stored up for the righteous. A good man. I like the way the Bible acknowledges that you can have a good man, which means you can also have a bad man. And when you talk of a good man, one of the characteristics of a good man, it is how he handles his wealth, his riches, his properties, even to the following and the succeeding generations. That calls for a lot of wisdom and knowledge and intelligence. Can I tell you what you are doing today, my friend? It will have what we call ripple effect even on some generations to come. And then when you look at this good man, the Bible says that this man will leave an inheritance. Inheritance is not just a name that you are, you know, children are called after your name or others are called after your children. No. Inheritance has also to do with the properties. Children will not clap for you because you, you are living or you are dead and you have left nothing tangible. My friends, I want to tell you, you must know that matters of money and wealth, inheritance, finances, they are moving down to so many other generations. And I wish to talk to you, if you are a man there, if you are a parent there, may God grant you the ability to be this good man who lives an inheritance. But uh, we also see the picture on the other side. We have some people aging, they are old, and they have wasted all their energy, all their time. And today what they do is they expect from their children and their children's children. I know you may console yourself. Yes, because I, I, I brought them up, I deserve. Mm -mm. It is okay, but remember for you to carry that good name, a good man. You need to pray, you need to ask God to help you that you may live an inheritance, not only to your succeeding generation, but also to the third generation. And this calls for you to believe God, because according to his word, God is able to enable you to do that. Why am I bringing you that information? I want to take you to the Bible, Second Kings chapter number 4. I want to take you there because we have a case study which I want us to dwell so much on. Second Kings chapter number 4. I want you to look at verse 1 through 7. We are going to look at this and it becomes like our case study which we need to know that in financial intelligence, all of us are supposed to come on board. We are supposed to learn. We are supposed to know things. I'll be telling you more about these terminologies. What is all this about financial intelligence? But let's look at the Bible. Second Kings chapter number 4, um, verse 1, I'm reading there. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Let's, let's look at that verse alone. This is a woman, it's a widow. The husband is dead. 
And uh, the background information is that this husband was also among the prophets. So somehow he was a good man. He was of good character. He was in the kingdom. He was serving God. But the Bible records that the woman is crying to Elisha. Now going to Elisha means she is recognizing the authority that was above the husband. Elisha had the anointing of a mentor, of a leader. He was above the sons of prophets. And so he, she comes to Elisha with a cry that, you know, my husband is dead. And my husband was in your team. He feared the Lord. Thank God for that. And the, the most astonishing thing is the following statement that she made. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. When you hear of a creditor, this is somebody demanding his right. That means this family had a debt that needed to be cleared. The Bible does not state that, maybe, that this, this debt was in card with maybe the sickness or the, the, the burial expenses of this man. Most likely you look at it deeper and you discover this was a debt that they consumed. They took that, they consumed. And I want you to see something. If the sons are being taken now to pay the debt, there are a few questions I may ask here. Is it in order for a man of this caliber to have a debt and, in quote, carelessly leave the family to suffer? Was he taking the sons as the collateral for the loan? Could that be the understanding? You know, when you are reading the Bible, you need to ask yourself a few questions. And it's very important to ask ourselves these questions. Because this family we are reading from Second Kings chapter 4 may be a reflection of many other families. Today, and especially after being hardly hit by COVID-19, things are now emerging. People are toiling in in stress and fatigue and depressions because of debts and loans they are unable to clear they are unable even to have both its meet why because the loan is there and maybe the way to pay is not adding up my friends i want you to see the questions i'm asking they are very important for all of us to ask ourselves was there not even a single, a single title deed, even if of a plot, that could salvage this family? That now the woman is crying that the creditor is coming. My friends, let me also tell you this. As I share this topic, remember we are dealing with this financial intelligence and it is to help us in real life. This is where real life empowerment is done here. And I want you to know, you, you don't need to miss out in this. I'm asking another question here concerning this family. If you look at the creditor who is coming, what had happened? Why was this money taken? Why was this loan in place? What did the loan do? I don't know whether you are aware we have what we call uh, consumer loans and we also have investment loans. You can take a loan to build your wealth. But you can also take a loan just to enjoy and you eat. So this could be the scenario with this family. Maybe, and I'm saying perhaps, this man had taken a loan and they enjoyed, they ate, including this 
<coughs> woman who is crying, she could have been a partaker of the parties and the picnics and even of eating and having all fun in the house with this kind of money. Something else, I'm still looking at this family. Remember, we are still in verse 1. The husband is dead. Why has it taken too long for the family to talk about the loan? It is good to know something that uh, the spiritual is not complete without the physical. You may be a prophet, a good man like this one who is mentioned here. You may be a very nice guy. You may be, you know, heaven-bound. You are spirit-filled. You have power. You know, you are a good preacher. You are a good person. You are a church person. And you do so much spiritually. But I'm here telling you, and I tell everyone, the spiritual cannot be complete without the physical. In other words, even if you live in church, you do all things, and I've said it again, you are still needed to provide to the physical. For sure, if I came to this program, if I came uh, to this show naked, nobody would even dare follow. If I didn't have a shirt, if I didn't have a twister jacket, if I was, I was naked, I'm telling you, people will look at it differently. So the spiritual <coughs> is not sufficient, it's not complete without the physical. And this is where we start and this is how we see things. The creditor must come. Can I remind you, you are there, you are saying, yes, I have a loan, I don't know what to do. Yes, you don't know what to do, but it is a property of another person. The moment you take that money, remember, it's not yours. It is a property of another person, and one time, he will come demanding it. So I say, Look at uh, the creditors surrounding you. <clears throat> they may not be people that you took a loan or money from, but you could be having so many creditors calling you, knocking at your door. Maybe even some items in your house demands a replacement. They are talking. The creditor is all over. And the one thing I want you to know, as I, as I quote Proverbs 22, <clears throat> verse 7, Proverbs 22, verse 7, the Bible says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a servant of the lender. I repeat, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower, mark that, the borrower is servant to the lender. So the moment you have subjected yourself and signing a loan and you've taken money, you've taken property from another person, you have borrowed. Immediately you become a servant. You're actually a slave to the person. And that's why <clears throat> when you are talking of a loan, you don't need to live like you are in the comfort zone. Somebody will come demanding. So you must set yourself knowing that this is a debt. It will be cleared one time. Even if you delay, it will be. I'm looking at a scenario nowadays because of the, of the situation of COVID-19. Even those tenants in houses where they are needed to pay rent. Some of them are feeling, sometimes you find like it is so comfortable because the landlord has given you an easy way. I said, no, I can close my eyes for these three months, but you can start paying after the third month. There is nowhere 
you find that landlord, very few are committing themselves to say, I'm giving you the three months for free. Very few. So in that scenario, you'll find your rent times three months. It's too much. And a time will come because the agreement is you'll have to pay. Your fight is so huge. I'm trying to show you that any time you are having a debt, you have a loan, you have borrowed, you definitely become a servant. And that's why the creditor now is coming. And if there is no money to pay from this family, the two sons are going to be slaves. The woman is not saying one son is going, one is remaining. The creditor is coming for two. In other words, the debt is huge. According to the Jewish culture, there used to be that. That if at all you are unable to clear, this creditor is not missing the mark. He is actually coming for his right. You now pick the sons, the male child, to go and serve in your estate. If the family, if the person, if the debtor is unable to clear your debt. So it was within his right to come for the two sons. I know some Bible readers may condemn, uh, you know, we like that. We have faith, <clears throat> we are anointed, and uh, we have the Holy Ghost. Yes, it's to cancel the debt. Yes, there is the cancellation of debt. But uh, remember, every creditor has a right to come for his property. I want us to look at verse number 2. We are still in, in uh, uh, Second Kings chapter 4. So after the woman cried to Elisha, what happens? You will find something very unique. Verse 2. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? I love that. What shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Your servant has nothing. Now, important to see the conversation between Elisha and this woman. I, I, I look at it and... Uh, I see Elisha speaking from a certain authority. The question is, how do I help you? What, what can I do for you? How? The word is how. In other words, Elisha is bringing in the aspect of the method. The method of exit from your debt. The method. What shall be done? What is the formula? What is the way to be followed in order for that problem to be over? Now look at this. When Elisha asked about the house, the same house where the problem is, Elisha knew the solution is still there. Oh, hallelujah. My friend, let me tell you, some of the financial of problems that are surrounding us so much, you discover according to the insight of the Holy Spirit, they have solutions in the same position. And that's how God looks at things. Elisha is asking the woman, what do you have? What do you have in your house? Can I say this? There are things you are holding with yourself and they carry your financial breakthrough. Things that you are holding, you may not know, but you need to pray, you need to ask God to help you. So Elisha referred the woman back to where the problem is. And look at this. The woman now, the way she is going to respond helps us now to know the problem that was in that family. Because the woman started by saying, your maid servant has nothing. Mark the word nothing. And then he puts another one, but 
only a jar of oil. Look at the way she is directing whatever is within reach. She is saying nothing. She does not even see like that jar of oil is anything. Actually saying nothing but. So that but tells you that jar of oil is nothing to me. It is nothing. But do you know that is where the answer is? Very true. And I, and I like when God is now looking at uh, not the, you know, the magnitude of things, but even the smallness of some things. Do you remember when he asked Moses, what do you have? What do you have? What are you holding? And that thing he was holding, it was a dynamic force against the forces of darkness in Egypt. Look at this woman. Your maid servant has nothing but a jar of oil. What do you see by that? That response alone shows you something I'm calling. Uh, it is a it's a mental deficiency. It is it is a deficiency in how you reason with yourself. Remember the topic is financial intelligence. So you need to understand how do you think, how do you rate the things you have, the items you have. Do you know how many people are sitting on gold and they are not aware, but they have adulterated everything they have. They don't see uh, the effect and the, the, the capability of what they have. Now look at this. The woman is saying, it's nothing. In the house, there is nothing. And uh, when somebody is so negative and seeing nothing uh, the, and the emptiness, that person will have a lot of work to be done on him or her so that you may see things in the right perspective. Can I tell you, everyone, under my voice, <clears throat> nobody is empty. Nobody is empty. And I repeat, nobody is empty, including yourself. You may tell me I have nothing. I've wanted to do this. I don't know where to begin. I have no capital. I want to tell you, nobody is empty. Somebody could now be holding tightly without awareness a very major a talent that is so explosive and can bring your resources on board. Somebody could be having very small capital, very small capital. I'll be showing you in a moment that you can create wealth from very little or even from no money. You can create wealth. I, 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 this is why I love my God. God is able to do, you know, abundantly immeasurably above what we think or what we ask. I want to show you this, that when the woman responded like that, it's a sign that your mentality will always limit your productivity. I say your mentality will always limit your productivity. Check on your mental asset the way you think you are reasoning <clears throat> because out of that and let me tell you people of faith as we believe in the word of god it is the same god who gives us the capacity to reason the ability to reason to manage ourselves to manage things and to do things according to his word i told you the other day i'm expecting explosive uh, dimension of of innovations people going into diverse ways and methods and you know dimensions of creation of wealth it is going to be it's going to be don't be scared by covid 19 we are overcoming yes we are overcoming god is bringing us to a position especially because of the establishment of his covenant the establishment of his kingdom in these last days. Let me show you something here. 
if you look at verse number three, we are following this. Second Kings chapter four, verse three, the Bible says, then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Do not gather just a few. I'm going verse by verse to show you something here. When Elisha told the woman to go and borrow vessels, and he says, not a few, many. Look at, look at that explosion. Elisha is now looking at uh, that family, that weak family, a woman and two sons, and the creditor is coming. And then Elijah, Elisha starts talking about greatness. He tells her, go and borrow many vessels everywhere. From your neighbors, your friends, get vessels, get containers, bring them home, borrow them. And I, I would ask a question here. What will happen with this kind of a woman in the village? Going, borrowing vessels. And people maybe have a hint that the creditor is coming. Yes, the creditor is coming <clears throat> to take your two sons. What on earth do you have to do with my empty gallon, with my empty container? What on earth do you have to do with that? But I tell you, the ways of God cannot be understood by human thinking. We normally see it in the spirit. And I declare today as I share this on financial intelligence, the Holy Spirit will grant you wisdom and understanding. Let me speak prophetically. May God come to your mind. May the Holy Spirit grant you insight to see that which is inside your house, that which is within you, that little in your wallet that can do dynamic things to produce wealth. Now, when Elisha is advising this, that you go and borrow many vessels, the word many is now a contradiction to the thinking of this woman. And uh, at times we need that. <clears throat> we need a word that contradicts your commonness, your commonly thinking. We need a word from heaven. We need a prophetic voice uh, to bring a contradiction to your norm, the way you have been looking at things. You need to change a paradigm shift in your thinking. This is what I'm asking God to release upon all of us. Now, borrowing vessels from the village also was to prove how connected this woman was socially. Because if she was not socially well knit with people, it would have been a major blow, a major problem, going borrowing things, and you are borrowing from people who you do not relate well with. Can I give you a word of counsel? Because you don't know which route God will apply to shift you from that level you are financially. Take care of relationships. Take care of relationships. Maybe God will lead you to your neighbor. God may lead you to your next door friend who is carrying the key to your financial breakthrough. And uh, as I bring this knowledge to you, remember that networking is so important. If we are to get out of debt, oh, I want to believe that one time I'll be showing you how to come out of debt because it's something, and I, I, some, I want you to know I don't teach things that I've never struggled with. I've also struggled with quite a number of these things. And uh, when I reflect now on the word of God, I come to see uh, realities and how to go about that. Remember your network equals your net worth. So this woman could get vessels 
based on how good he she was as far as the network was concerned and can i also remind you that you cannot succeed alone you can't succeed alone you need to be with others you need to be connected those people who devalue relationships even if it's a relationship between you and your spouse or between you and your parents between you and your children between you and your relatives i tell you it is very expensive to have good relationship and when you have one please do not destroy do not undermine and sure it sticks it will take you somewhere so the woman was sent by elisha to go and borrow uh, uh, the, the vessels but uh, before she went this is what verse 4 says and when you have come in after borrowing the vessels when you have come in you shall shut the door behind you and your sons then pour it what pour that oil into all those vessels and set aside the full ones hey what is elisha teaching elisha is not just speaking prophetically but she is teaching a trade she is now he is now he is now releasing the knowledge the understanding of how to produce how to have uh, what we call manufacturing now look at this she is told when you get vessels come to the house get in not outside get inside and then you close the door you make sure you have shut the door you are within that closet question number one here why close the doors what is all this about listen to me every production every trade every business has its own secret they are supposed to close the doors there's not something to show everybody it's not something to go telling people hey come and see let's try this the servant of god has told me to see whether it will work no the word was shut the door behind you in other words some secrets needs to be kept and I'm, as i talk this way there are things i may never know about you my friend but those things are helping you they are good things they are in good character but those are some of the secrets look at the companies i've related with the people working in different companies producing things manufacturing and there is a secret you will never know you will never know i'm not undermining or adorating any but how many other companies have tried to copy coca-cola and it's very hard to get the real thing because they know their secret it's not just chemicals and mixing with water and flavors no there is a secret i want to tell you even whatever you do don't don't think everybody doing things and you are seeing them that what they are doing they have exposed everything to you i doubt they are secrets as far as certain productions are concerned elisha told the woman when you get the vessels yes they may people may have even escorted her with the vessels but once they reach the house everybody else out apart from the sons and yourself then you close the door then you continue with the production and look at this she was told to pour the oil the little oil she had in that jar to pour now to all those vessels okay bible scholars have different interpretation there are some who feel like this woman never borrowed vessels because the bible does not say look if you look at the next verse it's like she left there and went straight to the house that one is one option but i highly sense 
because of the desperate situation she was in, she had to obey every single step that the servant of God <coughs> advised. Then something else, after you pour, look at that verse 4, it is very educative. After you pour that oil into the vessels, separate the full vessels, keep them aside. Did you know that is management? Managing and preservation of the product. Hallelujah. So the woman was taught by Elisha how to do things. Some of these things, they look common. They look okay. They are normal. Something you can tell yourself to do. But Elisha is specific because this thing that is about to rescue the entire family from the antagonism between them and the creditor, it was something that had to observe the details. And that's why I'm showing you. We observe these details and we see setting aside, that is taking care of your resources. They are full. You keep them aside. Verse 5 is important so that we see whether she will do that. Verse 5, the Bible says, So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured it out. They brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. You can see the obedience. Verse 6. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. Bring me another vessel. And the boy said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. The oil stopped flowing. Follow me to this point. And uh, you look at the woman pouring that little oil. Remember she had said it's nothing. But she's pouring and the vessels are getting full. They are kept aside. And the enjoyment. I wanted to see the, 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 that kind of a moment of pleasure whereby getting a vessel full. You know, by the way, when you talk of oil, and especially with the Jews, this was a very valuable commodity. They traded so much with the oil. It was needed everywhere. Talk of hospitals, talk of, you know, treating wounds, talk of anointing, talk of what, cooking, and oil was important. And actually even today, we know even here, it is variable. But uh, look at this. That enjoyment, she was enjoying that production. She was enjoying increase of her resources based on the obedience to the word she had received about having many vessels. If she enlarged her territory, if she took the word of faith and enlarged territory by increasing vessels, the more pleasure and joy in the production increase. That's something you need to know. That the moment you do not limit yourself by your thinking, by blocking your own way, you need to know you enjoy when you allow the word of God to flow in your life, to enable you to see the bigger picture. You keep enjoying uh, the flow and the increase. Um, and God's flow of our blessings can only stop. And that was stopped by us, but not get finished. I want you to see that. The oil did not get finished. The oil stopped flowing because God is not extravagant. God is not a waster. The oil could not continue flowing to no vessel. God will not allow his resources just to be wasted for people to see that he is rich. No, there must be a container. In other words, when God demands, 
that you have containers, he knows that he will make sure the content for the container will remain sufficient. But when the containers are not there, the oil stopped. Look at verse 7. Let's look at this so that I take you to something else before I close this. It's important to see this. Verse 7. The Bible says this. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. I love this. I appreciate what I see in this verse. The woman went back to Elisha to report. Even after seeing the miracle of increase, after seeing the multiplication of oil, vessels are full of oil, she never took any step of rushing out, calling people, come I distribute to you, come and buy. No. She left everything intact and went back to the servant of God, to Elisha, to report on the progress. Let me tell you, you cannot excel economically, financially, and more so in our generation if you do not and I repeat, if you do not become loyal to mentorship, there must be that mentorship. There must be that advice, word of advice, through the Bible, through counsel, through the word of God, through prayer, you need to know it's important. And I am a witness because I have prayed with a few people, some people who been toiling in dire need of trying to pay debts and they are coming uh, to Norway. And I've seen God lifting them. And the good thing is when people report back, they enable you as a servant of God to continue studying with them, praying for them. My friend, when you see the first miracle, it's not enough. Don't run away. And remain in God. Continue. Stick to the word of God. The word of counsel. This woman went back. Remember? She could be in a hurry because the creditor is coming. She could have been tempted to rush out and start selling. Preparing now for the creditor. No. She decided to go back to the servant of God. Remember. The source of your resources matter. It matters a lot. And you need to know if that is the origin of your miracle, your breakthrough, you need to relate with it so that there may be continuity. There may be continuity. Do you remember? Even when you look to, in the New Testament, when the disciples were called, the first disciples to be called by Jesus, the four of them, when Jesus performed a miracle, after they had toiled the whole night and they had no fish, but after the miracle and the boat and both the boats were full of fish, they drew the boats to the shore of the lake. But the Bible records they left everything there and followed Jesus. An indication that this is the source of our miracles, our blessings. We better stick to the source rather than we stick to the object. It is good to know. We check on our relationship with the miracle worker more than our relationship with the miracle itself. So this woman knew Elisha, this father of the society, as far as prophets are concerned, I need to report back. There is nowhere Elisha had told her after you see the miracle, come and tell me. And then I will guide you further. No, it was out of her own initiative. I'm stressing on this point because when I deal with financial intelligence, I will tell you for a fact, 
many people lose it at that point. And this is where you fight if you have it and you draw away from the grace that released it. You'll have an issue. Why do we talk of the, the, the prodigal son after receiving the property? He left the environment of grace, the environment of provision. And finally, he lost everything and came back almost naked, having nothing. This is important. The woman went back to Elisha. Now, what will happen? As I say, everyone needs the voice of a true man. It is, uh, the true man of God or servant of God. We need that. Like we know very well, as it was said during the time of Jehoshaphat. You remember very well that when you believe in God and God will establish you, but you also believe in the prophet and you shall prosper. It's good to believe the voice of a prophet. Mark the prophet I'm talking about. One who is upright before God, connected with the word of God, connected with the will of God, speaking for God's purposes. It's very important. So what will happen in verse 7? You have heard it very well. That three things she was taught. Three things. And I think this is where now I should say I can begin uh, to preach this thing. Three things where she was told. Number one, go and sell. <clears throat> Let me read it again so that you see. Verse 7, then she came and told the man of God. And he said to her, go, sell the oil. Number two, pay your debt. And number three, you and your sons live on the rest. In other words, keep trading, keep using, and you, you live, you occupy, you survive, live on the rest. Now, look at those three things, my friend. She is told, go. When you see the word go and sell, it means be busy. Be a busy. Uh, people in our uh, land, the Waswahili, they will say, Jeepers Shuguri, move, be on the move. Now you have something to do. You are occupied. You didn't have anything to do. You are only crying. You came crying here. Now it's not time to cry. It is time to work. Go sell the oil. Selling means trade. Interact now with the people. What do you need there? You must have communication skills. You must be fully aware of the product that you have. Can I tell you something? Maybe you have never seen it in the Bible. Many people had bought oil from many other centers, but no one could miss this one. This oil that came out of a miracle it was like the wine that Jesus made which carried the day this oil I'm sure the woman had something to say maybe the oil the bottles that he was, she was packing that oil in were labeled maybe called the miracle oil come and buy come and get this I'm sure people interacted with her to enjoy that miracle my friend, look at the advice she got. She could have missed the steps. She could have done other things. But the moment she went back to the servant of God, she was given the order. One, sell. Go and sell. And number two, wow, it's important to know this. Before I touch number two, there's something I've seen here. You must know how to market what you have. You must know. Because this is trade. And I have told you many times that the Bible talks about these things more than the, even the spiritual things. When you talk of trade, it is in the Bible. Selling, how to mission, you know, buy, sell. Those things are there. Even many 
many prophets have spoken concerning this in the Bible, especially the minor prophets. I'm showing you this because it's important you know that we need to be knowledgeable. We need to be equipped with information. Financial intelligence is important for us. And now look at this. When you see that you have something, you need to know how to market it. You need even to know how to market yourself, not even your commodity, yourself. You are there and you could be instrumental even in reaching many others. If it is for money, for income, please know how to do that. And even the services you offer, do your best. Do your best. If you are a service provider, do your best. Let it be known you are doing it with all your heart. It's important. And then number two, look at this. After selling, Elisha did not tell the woman, now go to the supermarket, go and buy food, go and keep for yourself. Number two, she was told, pay your debt. Pay your debt. After you sell and you have money, if you break this order, you'll fight, you go back to square one. You get money after selling the product. Then the next thing is you pay the debt. In uh, financial management, faithfulness is emphasized. You cannot be beating corners when you meet your creditor thinking you do that forever. If you know you are supposed to pay at this particular moment and you are selling, please, can you start with paying your debts? Can I tell you something? You will never have peace. You will not even enjoy. If you are hiding while eating the little you have because you don't want to be seen by your creditor, you are even trying to cover so that he may not see whether you have it. You are not enjoying. Be a free man. Train yourself to seek freedom. Freedom, both financially and uh, spiritually. The moment you pay your debt, there is joy in that. Remember that a borrower is always a slave and a servant to the creditor. How long do you want to stay in slavery? If God has given you an opportunity, because I'm talking to a group of people, they know how to pay it. They know when they're supposed to pay, but they want to delay. Every delay you have in paying your debt is actually building and heaping up your stress. May God enable you. Look at this. After you pay your debt, you are now told, and Elisha told the woman, you and your sons live on the rest. You cannot live now on the rest if you have not paid the debts. You don't enjoy your life. You don't feel comfortable. But when you have cleared that debt, you can now live on the rest. And let me tell you, don't underrate the word of God. This could have a meaning that whatever now you are left with will take you to your destiny. Even your sons will progress as far as uh, business is concerned uh, through that. Now, what am I showing you is that when you are living on the rest, you are able now to live within the means that God has given you. So those two, uh, three steps are very important. And I think I will emphasize them one other time when I will be dealing with how to get out of debt. I've received many questions since I started this series. People calling, people asking me, what do I do? I am unable to pay, it is heaping up, it's increasing. The interest is growing, 
bigger and bigger what do I do we'll be looking at that some other time but let me come to the close of this uh, <coughs> sermon today by showing you a uh, uh, point some points here that are very very important I want to tell you something that you need to know and uh, I'm telling you out of a very clean heart many people have researched I've also tried to look at it I've been asking myself the truth about this <clears throat> due to lack of financial intelligence do you know what happens if you look at a group of young people who are around a stock of 20 years 20 years if you take a hundred men of 20 years today you know they are in their prime age they can do much if you wait for them the next 40 years and you check at them at age 60 this is one of the most sad and sorrowful fact due to lack of financial intelligence these are the percentages that have been found and I know we can test that we can try and see by the time they will be 60 it will be only one of them one out of a hundred who will have attained what we call financial freedom that's a person we say extremely wealthy I'm not talking of just wealthy, but extremely wealthy only one and out of the hundred only four at age 60 will be rich and wealthy and five out of the 100 will still be working and struggling to make both ends meet 36 of them will be dead this is research out of the 100 36 will be dead others out of self-destruction others could be out of natural death and 54 of them 54 out of the 100 at the age at age 60 they will be broke a poor no coin depending on their relatives depending on their children even depending on government and even NGOs and church organizations having nothing I see it's a very sad fact when you look at it why what is happening especially with the 54 and the 5 the moment we lack financial intelligence we fight this scenario and uh, I've been praying since I came to know these things I've been praying even for the governments of our countries and especially Kenya because nations have something I call insufficient systems of education the, the education systems that we we, we took over from the colonial government it is a system training us to be educated so that we may seek jobs but very little about how we may create jobs and I think the issues affecting our nations today can tell us for a fact that we need to change our mindset that our education systems we need to look at them and ask God to help us because when I compare the time this country of Kenya was receiving independence 1963 when you compare with today the many graduate 
the many educated men and women we have. If you compare that number with the many offices or the offices that have opened for employment, it's like you're comparing death and sleep. It's the big gap. And this is why I say we may go for academics, but we must look for financial intelligence. I'm not saying this because I have attained my friends, I'm saying this because I'm in the prayer and this prayer will work. Let's you join me, we keep praying together. What will happen with even the succeeding generations that are expecting us to show them the way? I believe our curriculum should even accommodate topics and series and even uh, subjects showing our kids how to create money. If we are now debating on whether to teach on sex education in our system, why don't we discuss how to engage the young brains? Why don't we revive the business clubs in schools? Why don't we relate now the schools with the society concerning trade and we need to think of this financial intelligence is a major key i i, I thank god because uh, the few times that god has enabled me to visit the land of israel the last time i was there i noted something because i interacted even with the education system and i saw something unique with the jews and they even say it, it is written in their books that do not give children education for papers. Give children education for life. Teach them how to live. And that's why you find in the land of Israel today, a child of 10 years is like a jack of all trades trained in all fields. This person can even take Tiba and start now doing carpentry. This child is also trained in the forces. You can't just scare them. They are trained in all areas. Talk of farming. But oh, look at our children. Sometimes I sympathize. Yes, we are living in the rural areas. We are living in the urban areas and even in these areas you find wherever they are, our children, the only thing they are doing, you find them right in the house. We baby them so much. God help us. This is my prayer that we teach things that to help. Now, listen to this. There's a verse I see in, the, in Ecclesiastes as I come to close. I know my time is expiring. Financial intelligence, you find it in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 15. Let me read that verse. The wise man is saying, the labor of fools wears them. The labor of fools, you know, make them weary, tired, fatigued, for they do not know how to go to the city. The labor of fools, people with no intelligence, people with no understanding, people who are not wise, they labor a lot. They do a lot of work. They get tired. They get worn out. Why? Because they don't know the way to the city. What does that mean? The way to the city. The city here symbolizes greatness, civilization, wealth, wisdom, you know, prestige, things that are lucrative. That's what we are talking about when you talk of the city. And if one is not intelligent, will not get there. I think we need to have this way to go to the city. We need to have the way, the method, the formula to reach the city. 
and this is the summary of what I'm saying. Let me show you a few points and I'll be closing as I've said. Financial intelligence is the understanding of the inner operations of money. When you are talking of money, the inner operations, there are inner operations that need to be known. You know, money issues, we are talking of a subject, we are talking of a volume of things that need to be undertaken. Uh, and so, what does this entail? When you talk of the undertaking, the undertakings of money, they include the following. One, creating wealth with little or no money at all. Is it possible that you can create wealth from very little money or no money? I tell you, yes, it is possible. These are things I will prove later when we continue with this series. Number two, I'm talking about uh, the inner operations of money. They include number two, how to develop investment mentality. How to develop investment mentality. When you hear investment, it's not about only today. It's about your tomorrow. And I'll tell you this, that if you are not ready to think investment, you are not ready to come out of your poverty. We must be what I call savers. You must learn to save. You must learn to save. Because only savers go to investment. You can't invest if you don't know how to save. And this is where you find we'll be talking a little about management of finances. I am sorry I'm promising so many things to be done in the near future or I need to teach because they will help us to interrelate and understand this. Remember, it is not how much you invest but how early you start investing. Not how much but how early you start investing. That's what matters. Some have invested very little, but because they did not waste time, it has come out to be great, great investment. Never undermine. Don't be like the woman who had the little oil and said nothing. Invest even with the little that you have. Number three, the place of compound interest, the place of cash flow, the place of inflation, we need to know. We need to understand. This is when you, when you know the dealing of money in this manner. This is where you discover what is selling now, what is losing now. You are able now to flow with that. Open your eyes, open your, your understanding. Sometimes I look at people, they, they research things. While others are opening their computers just to see fun and maybe to have pleasure for their creation. Others are busy researching to know what is happening in the market. And I think we need to ask ourselves, am I gaining intelligence, knowledge, understanding as far as what I'm looking for is concerned. When others are reading newspapers and feeling crosswords and uh, watching and trying to follow just programs and others politics, the others who are in the same newspaper and they are looking for money and they are making money. So it's important to ask ourselves, do I have this kind of understanding? You also need to know number four, money operations you need to know. This is where you have the difference between assets and liabilities. Assets and liabilities. What do I say by that? What do I mean? When you're talking of assets and liabilities, you will only need to ask yourself 
a very simple question. What do I have that can build me? And what do I have that can destroy me? What am I doing that can build me? What am I doing that can bring me down? Assets and liabilities. You need to know what is a risky and what is an opportunity. This is where you understand. Even going to salaries and incomes, you need to understand. Yes, I have a salary. What is coming? What am I spending on? What will happen? What is remaining? These are inner operations of money. <clears throat> Even the knowledge about the difference between a good debt and bad debt. It's very important you know that. So that the moment you are looking at something, you will be able to say, am I here to gain or I'm losing? You may continue losing, yet you are saying. You only need to understand that. And may I say, many people are held by so many liabilities which they can actually get out of. But because they don't want to change or to break the status quo, they think they are comfortable there. But one time, it will hit hard on them. It is this period of COVID-19 that I taught people in the beginning of it that you have to know how to lighten the ship. You are already in a storm and the ship must sail across. You must go to the shore. You cannot keep holding every luggage and baggage in the ship. There are times you offload. You throw it so that the ship may be light to take you. To the end and finally how to make manage and multiply money I repeat how to make manage and multiply money I want to stop at that and uh, remind you this is financial intelligence and it is meant for you because you should be that good person, that good man who will leave inheritance to your children and your children's children. In other words, let the generation that is coming after you and also enjoy giving inheritance to their descendants. This is my prayer for all of us that God will help us and bless us. Let me pray with you. Because I've talked uh, so many things about financial intelligence. I want us to believe together and uh, hoping that we'll continue even next Wednesday to look at how to make, manage, and even multiply. Because all these things are within reach. And uh, these are the days I'm telling you do not undermine any avenue that God opens for you. Clean business, good relationship working towards this because it is the will of God that we may establish the covenant of God by this act of creating wealth. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you because of giving me my viewers that we may share the word I thank you so much, my Heavenly Father, because of the Word of God. Even when we look at the family that was rescued by Elisha, yes, there was the performance of the miracle. But we are opening our eyes to see that the miracle rotated around what they had. And I want to ask you, Father, that as we seek divine intervention, May you help us to value that which you have put into our hands. I pray, God, that you bless our families, bless our houses, bless, oh God, our offices, bless whatever you've allowed us to do. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. My God, I speak financial intelligence to my viewers, to their children, to their spouses, to their people, to their families. God, enrich 
your people and especially in the household of faith. This is my prayer that we shall not remain down. We shall not go under. We shall go over. It is my prayer that we are coming out of debt. Jehovah God is my prayer that you enable us to know the inner workings and operations of money. God Almighty, may every opportunity accorded us bear fruit. I know I'm speaking and I'm praying with the people who are still troubled. They don't know what to do. I want to declare God Almighty there shall be an answer. I declare they will be out of debt. They shall overcome. God Almighty, this is what I believe. That you are raising an army. In these last days, you are raising an army. Give us innovations. Give us the power to invent even new ideas as you said in your word. I thank you, Father. Also, we pray, forgive us where we've neglected the word of counsel, even from the prophet. My God, I ask that you help everyone to be reporting back to the source of the miracle, to back to God that we may honor you, Jehovah. This is my prayer for everyone. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you so much, my viewer. I bless your name and your life. I bless your people. I bless your family. And I thank God because you mean a lot to us. When I see your comments, when I see you writing, and saying something and liking this page. I want to thank you very much. And I speak those blessings upon you. May you be financially intelligent. That you may go to financial independence. This is a time also to give. We like saying that we have our number. It is a free number where you just go to M-Pesa. And then it's still number. Buy goods and services till number 904-260 and the amount you deposit there shall be received into our Jesus New Life Ministries General Church account and God will bless you as you continue standing also with the work of the kingdom. A give and it shall be given unto you. And especially when you hear such teachings, please do not be compelled do not be pushed. Do not be coerced. Let it be a free will. For if your willingness is there, then your gift is acceptable. God bless you. I love you. Shalom. <laughs>